Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So while we're on the subject, I just wanted to get into some things that many people probably don't have a clue that are actually in the Bible. And, you know, the unfortunate part is most people haven't really studied it. They haven't really read what's in there. They just listen to a few quotes here and there, and that's about it. But when you really do an in-depth study and, and you study other traditions as well, there's a lot of things that really stand out. Here in Leviticus 25, 44 to 46, However, you may purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around you. You may also purchase the children of temporary residents who live among you, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat them as slaves, but you must never treat your fellow Israelites this way. So right there, that's actually a, a condoning slavery. And it's not the only quote. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he may serve for no, no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. If he was single when he became your slave, he shall leave single. But if he was married before he became a slave, then his wife must be freed with him. If his master gave him a wife while he was a slave and they had sons or daughters, then only the man will be free in the seventh year. But his wife and children will still belong to his master. But the slave may declare, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I don't want to go free. If he does this, his master must present him before God. Then the master must take him to the door and doorpost and publicly pierce his ear with an awl. After that, the slave will serve his master for life. So these are all in the Bible. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she will not be freed after the end of six years as men are. So there's a lot of this. And it gets into arranged marriages and everything and what you do with them and sexual intimacy as well. There's tons of these. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. So obviously, you know, there's no rights. Yeah, there's no modern rights, thoughts of the rights of the individual. And so if this is truly the, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, wouldn't you think that he would have a little more wisdom than this? People will say, well, that's just the times. Well, the times were human, you know, and humans were running things. So maybe this is really just a case of people justifying their behavior and it has nothing to do with the creator of the universe, nothing at all. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you, as slaves of Christ. Do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than from pe for people. Remember, the Lord will, will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. 1 Timothy 6. All slaves should show full respect for their masters so that they will not bring shame on the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers. Luke 12, and a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much more will be required in return. And we go on to Hosea 9.11. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception, even if they rear children. I will bereave them, everyone, woe to them, when I turn away from them. I have seen Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. Bring out their children to the slayer. Give them, Lord, what will you give them? Give them wombs that miscarry and breasts that are dry. Because of their wickedness and Gilgal, I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house, saying, I no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. Do you think that's the loving God of the universe? Really? That's, that's, that's love? Here's a test for an unfaithful wife, which is kind of crazy. And um, 
you know, I'll just put the link in there because it's just bizarre, ritualistic, and str just strange. Numbers 31, 17 through 18. Now therefore kill every male amongst the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with them. But all the women, children that have not known a man by lying with them, well, keep them for yourselves. And this is, again, God talking to the Israelites before they go and kill another tribe of people. And we've seen this time and time again in the Old Testament where God supposedly, supposedly the creator of the universe is constantly telling this tribe to go and rape, plunder, and pillage and, you know, basically take whatever you want and kill everything else. Do you really think that's the creator of the multiverse? Do you really think that's showing love? Hosea 13, the people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed on the ground and their pregnant women ripped open. Oh, that's, there's a lot of love there. And then this is 2 Kings. Second Kings is full of a lot of stuff that's really interesting. And, um, you know, here it says the Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died. And he lived in a separate house, and it gets into other things as well. And, you know, there's an awful lot of death and destruction and infliction. And over here, you see, at, at that time, starting out from Terzah, they attacked Tipsa and everyone in the city and its vicinity. They were always on the attack, ever expanding their kingdom and doing it in the name of God. And this still goes on to this day. This is part of the whole system that is still in place. Because they refused to open the gates, he sacked tips up and ripped open all the pregnant women. Is Do you really want to follow a God that gives orders like that and condones that type of behavior? Is that really God or is that just men justifying their actions? 1 Samuel 15, now go attack the uh, uh, Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camel, and donkeys. There's a lot of love in there, isn't there? And again, that's God instructing. Psalm 135, 8, he causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with rain and brings the wind down from his storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast. Do you really think that's the case? Now, maybe a vindictive alien, <laughs> extraterrestrial, or perhaps a demon. And somebody had made a comment in one of the other videos today saying that the jinn uh, are beings of fire in Islamic lore and you know basically thought of as being kind of negative beings of fire they appear as fire what uh, what did god appear to moses as in the burning bush fire right so is this really god or is this something else trying to make it look like it's the source of all creation or is it just simply men justifying their deeds that they know are evil Blessed is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. That's a lovely Psalm 137 there. And Judges 11.30 And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatever cometh forth from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering, a burnt offering of children. This is Judges 11.30. Psalm 137 again. O daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, blessed is he who repays you as you have done to us. Blessed is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. You know, where's turning the cheek on that one? Many people have said to there appears to be two different gods here. You know, there's the God that Christ talked about and then the God of the Old Testament. And when Christ was basically um, confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said to them, you know, get behind me because, you know, you don't know my God. Basically, he said, you serve the other side, evil, you know, and 
many people do believe there is just one singular devil or Satan. And, um, you know, it, it just perplexes me sometimes to think that, uh, how people could have these points of view when obviously, you know, there might be a king, but kings come and go in time and uh, a lot of rulers come and go as well. So, you know, there can be, uh, say, a driving force, a leading force in a particular species of being that we would call demonic for sure. Uh, but looking deeper, I, so much of this stuff is just stuff that has been so ingrained in us and we don't question things, but we, it's the time to question now. That's what this is. This is the apocalypse, which is the great unveiling. It's not necessarily destruction of all life and judgment. We could see in the Old Testament an awful lot of fear and judgment and putting people to the death by the sword, putting infants and animals to the death by the sword, and raping and plundering and pillaging and doing it in the name of God. And, you know, I would think most people could see that this feels an awful lot like people justifying their actions. And in today's world, this would just be simply the same thing as running into a crowded uh, fair or bazaar with, you know, a bomb wrapped around you and blowing yourself up with 20 others. What's the difference here? They think they're doing it for God, too. So, you know, you just see so many of these. Look at this one, Second Kings. Then the king asked her, what's the matter? And she answered, the woman said to me, give up your son and we eat him today and tomorrow we will eat my son. So we boiled my son and ate him. And the next I said to her, give up your son and we will eat him. But she has hidden her son. You know, this stuff is brutal. It's just brutal. And some will say, well, that was a sign of the times. But it's the mindset, the mindset that people think that they're born into original sin. And if we look at the Sumerian writings, what's the original sin? Well, we kind of procreated a lot and we, you know, uh, populated the earth and got to be kind of noisy. And so Enlil wanted to get rid of us all, but Enki basically tried to save some. And, you know, when you look at it from these point of views, it could open up a lot of eyes. So there's so much brutality in here and they, there's so much direct opposition to the teachings of Christ that you wonder, even though he was born into the, the Judeo tradition, when especially you look at some of the Gnostic texts, and we will look at that as well, it feels like you're talking more to somebody that has studied some of the Eastern traditions or the mystery traditions. And that is showing a lot more wisdom than what's shown in uh, the Old Testament. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened them will not hearken unto them, then the father and the mother shall lay hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the gates, and unto the gate of the place, and they shall say to the elders of the city, This is our son, he's stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard, and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones so that he dies. Beautiful divine justice right there. And Judges 19, look, let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine, and you could use them and do with them as you wish. But do not do such a vile thing to this man. You know, it's like if a foreigner or somebody else comes up, you're showing uh, hospitality by taking them into your house. And, and we had seen, you know, where... He's actually offering up his own daughter to be raped. How many of you guys would do that? I mean, does that sound logical to you uh, over, you know, some foreigner that comes in? And we shouldn't think of anybody as necessarily a foreigner because we are all on the same planet. And, you know, when you do some traveling, you see that this planet's not that big. It, you know, when not in the modern sense of things. And we're all of one tribe, ultimately, and we're all living on the same planet. And so this is in Joshua, and the book of Joshua is one of the most brutal ones, where after the Israelites had been wandering for 40 years, they got to Canaan, and they just exterminated one group of people after the other. And there are some that will say, well, they, those, all those people had the blood of giants in them, all of them. Yeah, they all had the blood of giants in them. And so it was righteous to go and kill them all. And do you really think so? Or, you know, is that sounds to me a lot like Hitler and the Jews, doesn't it? Uh, or any other group like that that we want to single out 
so that people could do vile things to them and carry off plunder. So the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you. Go up and attack Ai. And for I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai and his people and his land and his, and his city. You shall do to Ai and its king what you did to Jericho and to its king, except that you shall carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set up an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack, and he chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out, on, out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You're to set up an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you be on the alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city, and when the men come out against us, as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city, for they will say they are running away from us, as they did before. So when we fl flee from them, you are to rise up from the ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded, setting it on fire, killing everybody. See to it, you have my orders. Then Joshua sent them off, and they went to their place of ambush, lay in wait between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent the night with the people. Early the next morning, Joshua mustered his army, and he and the leaders of Israel marched before them to Ai. The entire force that was with them marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. They then set up camp north of Ai with the valley between them and the city. Joshua had taken about 5,000 men, set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So the soldiers took up their positions with the main camp to the north of the city and ambush to the west of the city. And that night Joshua went into the valley. When the king saw this, he and all the men of the city hurried out early in the morning to meet Israel in battle at a certain place overlooking the Arabah. He did not know that ambush had been set against them behind the city. Joshua and all Israel let themselves be driven back before them. And they fled towards the wilderness. The men of Ai called to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were lured away from the city. Not a man remained in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. They left the city open and went in pursuit of Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out towards Ai the javelin that is in your hand, for in your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out towards the city the javelin that was in his hand, and as soon as he did this, the men in his ambush rose quickly from their position and rushed forward. They entered the city and captured it and quickly set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising into the sky. They had no chance to escape in any direction. The Israelites who had been fleeing towards the wilderness had turned back against their pursuers. Or when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and smoke was going up from it, they turned around and attacked the men from Ai. Those in the ambush also came out of the city against them. So they were caught in the middle, and the Israelites on both sides. Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives. But they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Joshua had finished the killing of all the men at, in, of Ai in the fields and in the wilderness where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those that were in it. Twelve thousand men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. And, you know, this is just one of them. There is so many like this. Does that sound like, you know, a God you want to follow, really? Uh, you know, the day of the Lord is coming. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce judgment to make the land desolate and to destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. You know, it's disobedience, for one, that is the punishment. Disobedience of the God, which is probably just another being or really just another human in this case. Uh, I don't know how anybody could be inspired by this. You know, I've studied it my entire life since I was 11, so it's like 43 years. And I, it just perplexes me, you know, honestly. And uh, 1 Kings 16, 34. And, you know, there's a lot of sacrificing of people. Uh, you know, there's a lot of putting to the sword. In Ahab's time, heal of Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. He laid his foundations at the cost of his firstborn son. Erbram, and set up its gates at the cost of his second youngest son, Sibgub, in accordance with the word of the Lord, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. There's human sacrifice there. 
Leviticus 26.30, I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies. And It just goes on and on. How about Elisha and, you guys remember Elisha? So this is another uh, well-known biblical person, let's put it that way, prophet. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. So Elisha turned around, looked at them, and called a curse down on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 kids. Wow, that's just, wow, that's really righteous judgment, is it not? And this is another one in Judges 21.10. It goes on and on, guys. It goes on and on and on. Numbers 31.7, again, Midianites, again, Take all the plunder, take the virgins, kill everything else. Deuteronomy 20.10 When you marched up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open, your, open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor. They'll be slaves. And they will work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to the city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put, all the sword, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as your plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. And so Deuteronomy 22:28, If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married, and he rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver, and then he has to marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. And the next part of that is also um, the fact, I mean, she's his slave, and she has no say in the matter at all. And just like here, if a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, so she's pledged to be married to somebody else, and this guy sleeps with her, then you shall take them both out of the gate to the t of the town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream loud enough for help, and the man because he violated another man's wife. So stone them and kill them both. And then marrying a captive woman. So when you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take captives, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you could take her as your wife. Bring her to your home and have her shave her head, trim her nails, and put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. After she has lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. If you are not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave, since you have dishonored her. And this is again talking about the day of the Lord, and when plunder will be divided, Basically, yeah, plunder is the key word here. We see a pattern. If this is all about conquest. Now, look at the world that we have. Is not this system still in effect? Is not this system, is it not really the same system that we had in Rome, in the British Empire, and we now are seeing in the current day? This system's never changed. So who is really controlling things here? Who is really controlling things? What do you guys think? How many of you have heard these? And I know there's going to be some of you out there that are going to defend this because you'll defend it because that's what you were taught and you don't know anything else and, and you can't think too logically about this. This is not loving teachings. Not at all. But it is the system that we see still in place. Plundering. Natural resources conquering one land after another this this is exactly what is still going on to this day it really hasn't changed my friends so i hope this maybe has opened up some more eyes and there's this is only the beginning we could get into tons more tons more than this there is so much more in there that most people you know really don't understand what's in there and they will do their best to defend it even the things that are just completely indefensible 
So my friends, as always, like, share, subscribe, click the bell, get all notifications. Time for everybody to wake up. Time for everybody to see what's been going on. And the justification of atrocities in the name of God. You know, all this, it's time for it all to stop. It's time for us to wake up and actually shed our chains and shed the blinders that have been on us for thousands of years. The system that's been in place for thousands of years. God bless my friends. Namaste.